May Allah's peace be upon you. In this episode, God's willing, we will deal with atheists' most notorious suspicions, regarding proof of perfection. Atheists say, why are there so many planets and stars? Why is cosmos so immense? We only need planet Earth. This suspicion, depends on the fallacy of, humanizing God, for atheists, as they try to make God a human. Since human beings suffer from lack of resources, so it's supposed, that they must spend as little as available, to achieve the best result. Atheists imagine that God is like human beings. Exalted is he and high above what they say by great sublimity. If God created billions and billions of universes like our universe, would that lessen his depositories? God, the Almighty, creates what he wills, and we must reflect upon his great omnipotence, and wonderful wisdom, which he wrapped in his creation. For this question, do these big planets and stars have benefit? The answer is, firstly, we aren't alone in this universe. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 42 Surat Al-Zura, verse 28. <laughs> Secondly, not knowing the benefit of something, doesn't mean that it is useless. As lack of knowledge, does not mean, knowing nothingness. As lack of knowledge, does not mean, knowing nothingness. Thirdly, we know that minerals, which a life depend on them vitally, only were formed in the core of tremendous supernovas, in huge astral ovens. Inside stars, minerals, which are in our bodies, are made. All minerals, which we need in our life, have been formed inside stars. The best example for this is ferrum, iron. Iron, which transfer oxygen to your lungs. Iron, on which modern civilization was built. Fourthly, it turned out that inertia that we live off today, is a result of the mass of the whole universe. What does inertia mean? If you are on a moving bus, suddenly the bus stops, what happens? Your body is pushed forward. This is inertia. If inertia was a bit lower than usual now, the weakest breeze, would move the biggest rocks. In such a world, we would be susceptible, to physical attack, from everything around us. Since everything would hit you with the slightest movement. If inertia was a bit higher than usual now, we wouldn't able to move a finger easily. Inertia is linked to mass. The interesting thing that fascinated physicists, that the Milky Way galaxy, that contains our solar system dash despite its huge size, it only shares to inertia adjustment 0.1 of a million. On the other side, Earth's mass only share to inertia 0.001 of a million. Hence the perfect inertia, that we live off today and do our activities, is a result of the mass, of the whole universe. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 39 Surat S.A.D., Verse 27. Whenever science expands, the wonders of wisdom, and creation appear. Now, let's move to the second question, that atheists ask regarding proof of perfection. Here's the thing, how could we, the human beings, be the center of this universe? In a huge universe like this, how could we be, with our tiny size on this small planet, the center of this immense universe? The answer is as follows, that assumption, which says that since human is so small and the universe is so huge, so human isn't the center of this universe, is based on this introduction. Since these fields are vast, and its owner is small comparing to them, so he isn't the owner. It's not about size at all. Moreover, morals, which don't have any size, is the standard of differentiation between people. The standard of differentiation, between the greatest, and the most despised, is based on morals, that don't have size. Yes, it's not about size at all. Saving a child is greater than all mountains, isn't it? That little child is more precious than all mountains. Hence, the issue of sizes, whether it's big or small, isn't standard. Let's put forth this example. There's a king who wrote, a will for his son, of what may benefit and harm him. Can anyone say, how does this king, 
who possesses million of acres and countless territories, care for his son when that son isn't even one divided by billions of those acres size. God, has the most high parable. Is this considered, a logical objection? Hence, the issue of sizes, and weights, isn't standard. Isn't it that the universe emerged, from a point that's billions of times smaller, than a pinhead, as every physicist on the earth confirms? Hence, size is relative, so is time. Wandering from huge, or tiny size, creation, or the longevity, or shortness of the universe, is just an attempt of them to humanize God, making God a human. O oh atheists, what bothers you if God create what he wills, the way he likes, and in any size he wills? But are we actually, the center of this universe? Yes. Human beings are the center of this universe, according to divine commissioning. By divine commissioning, you have become, the center of this universe. Commissioning, doesn't have to be for the largest ones. Rather, it's logical that commissioning is for those, who really comprehend, the meaning of it, for those who are capable of doing good, and getting away from bad. By the way, like it or not, we all know that we are commissioned. Everyone, whether they are believers or atheists, know that they are commissioned, and feel the divine commissioning inside them. As they suffer from conscientious objection, and know that they are commissioned by what to do, and not to do, do something good, and don't do bad deeds. We all know spontaneously that we are responsible. We are in the center of this universe, on the commissioning level. Also, we are in the center of this universe cognitively, and perceptually. We cognitively, and perceptually, know the reality of universe around us, and know the purpose of our existence well. Also, we are in the center of this universe ethically, and morally. A little child is more precious, than all the mountains in the world. Also, we are in the center of this universe religiously. As we are the responsible, and commissioned ones. We are the beings, who realize the perfect creation. We are the beings, who realize the, proof of perfection, and its requisites. We are the beings, who are capable of fulfillment, of what we had commissioned of, and capable of rejecting that commissioning. We are able to choose. We are able to choose between faith, and disbelief. We are the center of this universe. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 33 Surat Al-Azab, Verse 72. Now, let's move to the third question, that atheists ask regarding, proof of perfection. Atheists say, it's normal that the earth has levels of perfection, because there are other many planets on which don't have life. So, it's normal to find a planet with such great perfection. The answer is as follows, what's the relationship between the existence of many planets, and disproving, proof of perfection? The issue isn't about, raw materials. If I'm in a forest full of all kinds of vegetables, fruits and animals, this isn't justification, for the existence of a food bowl full of delicious cooked food, that suddenly appeared in that forest. We cannot justify the existence of that bowl, since its components exist in the forest. The issue isn't about, raw materials. The abundance of sand in deserts across the world, is not a justification for the existence of digital processors, and electronic chips, that are made from sand. It's not normal at all to find these processors, in the middle of deserts by accident. The issue isn't about, raw materials, rather it's about creating and mastery, know-how. It isn't just, raw materials, it's not since there are many planets, so it's normal for that fascinating planet, to emerge among them. Rather it's an issue of creating, and mastery. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 27 Surat Al-Namal, Verse 88. The existence of many other planets, neither justifies the existence of life on earth, nor genetic encryption within you. Genetic encryption that encodes organs, hormones, and functions as well. It encodes them with fascinating adjustment. What does, genetic encryption, mean? Let's simplify this term. 
gene is a very long ribbon, and the properties of an organ of your body is written on it cryptographically. For instance, so that the liver could be formed, a certain number of genes must exist, and the components of the liver, how it is formed, what functions it will do, and what proteins it will produce, and their amount as well, all of these are encoded in each cell of you, even before your birth. All of these are encoded in each cell of you. Each organ, enzyme, and hormone, is encoded in your genes. There are 30,000 genes in each cell of you, that encode all biological functions you do. Life is not material, rather it's information. All biological systems in all kinds of living beings, aren't material, but informational. Life is not just material, rather it's information. Life is an informational system. The number of letters, by which your genes were written, are 4 billion inside each cell. Life is not just material, rather it's information. Life is an informational system. The number of letters, by which your genes were written, are 4 billion inside each cell. The problem is that, atheists deal with living beings, and creatively perfected system, around them as if it was a puzzle. They disassemble the components of life and perfect system, then they misassemble them, from different places. They disassemble the intended, then they try to reassemble it. Such a strange way of thinking. Proof of perfection, is a mental proof that cannot be override, by such atheistic hypotheses. The need to justify that perfection, encryption, informational systems, and universe, is an urgent mental need. Atheists face a mental dilemma, if they were truly researchers. If an atheist and me went up to one of the planets, and found a sophisticated device, that works with dazzling adjustment, even if we didn't comprehend its function yet, the mental axiom will push us, the atheist and I, towards believing in the existence of the one who made it. Whoever denies that mental axiom, which is the existence of a creator, is required to provide the evidence, not the one who accepted the axiom. As the one who accepts the existence of the creator, goes according to the mental axiom. But the one who denies the mental axiom, is required to provide the evidence for his denial. In this elegant and perfect universe, atheists are required to provide the evidence, not the ones who accept the existence of the creator. As the one who accepts the existence of the creator, goes according to the mental axiom. But those who deny the existence of the creator, are obstinate to that axiom. Frankly, I am deeply surprised, by those who try to sophisticate proof of perfection, with those weird assumptions. The basis of contemporary experimental science, is to observe the proof of perfection in life, and universe. After that, scientists get awards for perfection proofs that they have observed. Let me tell you a joke that show how atheists outwardly opinionate the proof of perfection while, they are, at the same time, acknowledge that proof inwardly. One day, Carl Sagan, the famous agnostic, wrote a novel entitled, Contact. He wrote about how scientists are looking for extraterrestrial life. That novel says that, scientists suddenly discovered long series of prime numbers, coming from the outer space. Since that prime sequence equals a specific mathematical value, that refer to some kind of adjustment, that was a mental proof enough for the scientists to assert, that message came from another civilization that tries to communicate with us. All studies that search for extraterrestrial intelligence will be content to observe such a sign, to prove the existence of another civilization that tries to communicate with us. The strange thing here, is that Carl Sagan is a famous agnostic, but his mind accepts that a small message that contains a kind of complexity, is proof for creation and perfection. By just a sequence of prime numbers, you will be sure about the existence of a great civilization. What about the four billion letters inside each cell of you, if one single letter of them were disordered, there would be a disaster. How could you attribute all this perfection to those quirks you assume? It's not logical at all, to tend to assumptions, absurdities and guesses, in order to prevent explaining the phenomenon within its framework that indicates the creator. This is only abolishing mental axiom. If we were at this point with this data, refusing to believe in the creator, at what point will we accept his existence and submit to him? Under what item will we get ourselves out of disbelief?
I swear to God, you won't find such people that turn to hypothesizes mess with them as much as atheists. It is these hypothesizes that mess with them. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 10 Surat Yunus, verse 101. <laughs> By any evidence from outside us, are we required to rebel against the proof of perfection that we feel? By any evidence, are we required to rebel against whatever occurs, under our consideration? If we were at this point, still refusing to believe in the Creator, when will submit to Him? Now, the situation was turned on its head. We are the ones who convince atheists, to recognize the mastery we observe by our senses. But he reject and oppose the sensory observation, even though he is an advocate for materialism. Proof of perfection is a fact settled in the universe, life, encryption, and informational systems. Science itself, is founded hopefully that this universe, and living beings, contain perfection. If it did not recognize this fact, this means that there's no room for science. As there wouldn't be a single correct mathematical equation that can be proven. If science missed the acknowledgement to proof of perfection, it won't trust in any law, equation, or theory. Because everything might change in any moment, and all systems might be disordered at any time. Science itself is founded, hopefully, that this universe must be perfect. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 32 Surat Al-Sajda, verse 4. The more surprising thing, is that contemporary experimental science, established the principle of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism, confirms that laws of nature are immutable, throughout space and time. These laws can be measured, and you can trust their outcome. The universe has fine-tuning and perfection, whether we observed it or not yet. Science recognizes that fact, even before observing or discovering it. Allah, the Almighty, says in the Noble Quran, Chapter 27 Surat Al-Namal, Verse 88. <laughs> this is what science say, everything is perfect. By the way, the definition of uniformitarianism is one of the course questions, for those who intend to take the test. This is one of the course questions. So, I highly recommend that you use pen and paper, and write down notes from the get-go. For today's assignment, read the same book from the last two episodes, Proofs for God's Existence. Until the next episode, we will read the whole chapter 3, and till page number 481 from chapter 4. You can find the book, in first link in description. Thanks for listening. May Allah reward you well. May Allah's peace, mercy and his greetings be upon you.